Cape Inn Report, and I'm your host, Maureen Aylward. Our topic, a conversation with faith-based leaders about the holidays. My guests, and please welcome to the table, uh, Pastor and Neen from the St. Paul Lutheran Church in Lanesville, Gloucester, and Rabbi Stephen Lewis from Havat Akim in Gloucester, the temple, and Reverend Susan Moran of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Rockport. Welcome to Cape Ann Report. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Um, the holidays and this time of year um, can be this intersection of struggle and celebration. This, uh, you know, what we like to take a look at, the light coming from the darkness or the light and celebration um, of, the, uh, of what we believe um, whether it's uh, faith-based or nature-based, um, we all connect to nature and uh, the time of year celebration and our families coming together for holidays, whatever way we um, celebrate this time of the year. So I wanted to bring you together to have a conversation around the table about this intersection of struggle and celebration because I feel like it's there. Let's talk about it. <laughs> um, Rabbi Lewis, starting with you, the, we're in a state of uh, society of uh, intolerance and, um, and, and uncertainty and um, difficulties in expressing ourselves or really processing and understanding what's happening. And I'm putting the question to you first. Like, how, how are you approaching some of these issues of intolerance and uncertainty, and how are you managing your your community at this time of the year? Or how are they managing me? How are uh, they managing you? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the uh, in terms of the holidays, you you start with uh, what the texts give you or what the season gives you. So we're starting with Hanukkah, right. um, and Hanukkah is actually uh, has a lot of uh, resources. It's a complicated holiday, it turns out, um, many layers. Um, the question of danger is embedded in the earliest sources on Hanukkah. Uh, the question of whether that, that the uh, one is supposed to light their Hanukkah or menorah outside, supposed to celebrate the miracle. Uh, what exactly that miracle is is a little bit in, in dispute. Um, but even in the Talmud, uh, in the earliest source for this, um, of this version of Hanukkah, it says, but in a time of danger, you can light in your house. So all right from the very beginning, there is a sense of how comfortable do we feel expressing our religious truth publicly. Um, and certainly that uh, was very present, that, that challenge was very present for people this year, as it has been for the last a uh, few years with the rise of um, hostility and violence directed toward all sorts of minority groups, including Jews. Um, so that is certainly a, uh, a challenge of Hanukkah, and the, the whole idea of bringing light in darkness is sort of the message of Hanukkah, where you increase the light uh, every night, an additional candle. There's a debate in the earliest strata of uh, rabbinic literature about whether you should actually start with eight <laughs> and end with one, right. um, and there's very interesting uh, arguments on both sides, uh, and the, the conclusion that you don't take holiness out of the world, that you should always increase in holiness. And the detail about Hanukkah, which is it begins unusually on the 26th of the lunar month, meaning that Hanukkah always crosses over a new moon, meaning a completely dark night, mm -hmm. and that new moon is almost, uh, is almost always, or I mean, very rarely, that is not the longest, darkest night of the year. In other words, it's not the solstice, it's not the longest night of the year, but it's the longest night without a moon. Right. So that is the darkest time of the year in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so you're always lighting conic candles through that and sort of, so you're kind of bridging to the light leaving, to the light coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so those messages uh, resonated very strongly this year. Yeah, it must, and, and um and how is that working in the Lutheran community, and especially as a Christian-based community? And uh, just following on something that Rabbi Lewis said, uh, this idea of celebrating outwardly 
religion, and you can't get away from it during Christmas time. So, how how are you coming uh, at this issue? Of well, again, it goes to I think Rabbi Lewis said very beautifully what the texts give you, and so you know there's a there's a calendar that we move through in the church here, and it takes us through these various phases of um, uh, liturgical seasons with kind of a, fo fo a focus in each one that's different. Now, our calendar is based on Jesus' life, so um, we move through these phases of Jesus' life. And in this time of the year, in Advent, uh, we do a lot of talking about the light that's coming into the world and also hearing from that this isn't something new that God has been doing. God's always bringing light into the world. And we revisit prophets like Isaiah and various others <laughs> who will speak of the great comfort. Um, but there's also a kind of apocalyptic flavor in Advent because we talk about the end of history as well. So there's um, Advent becomes a season where you're waiting to uncover and discover what um, new life can come forward, what the new birth is, what this, this possibility of, of uh, something profound, but it doesn't come without labor and struggle, and labor and struggle are a part of, of Advent, and we start out with very apocalyptic texts of the end times, and the heavens shake, and the stars fall, and there's all this sort of, ugh. and of course, our event started a few weeks, uh, uh, maybe a month and a half after the climate change report came out from the intergovernmental panel. So and it sort of felt like It felt like, oh, here we are. <laughs> it is the apocalypse. So what are we actually going to do about this? <laughs> so it was actually very powerful to proclaim right. this kind of stuff in right. the midst of really, really hard times. Right. And for me, that's like where the rubber hits the road yep. and, and in communities is that we always in, are in these places of struggle. We're always, there's something always horrific coming coming mm -hmm. about. I yeah. became a pastor in 2002. In 2003, we invaded Iraq. So that was like poof, right in there. Yes. You know, so it's just been like that since. There hasn't been one year of normalcy and my idea of whatever normalcy is, which is maybe not war. You know, right. we have been at war right. the whole time I've been a pastor. All, all these kinds of things have been going on. Um, mm -hmm. Immigration's been going on. Intolerance has been going on and it's yeah. just been heating up. And now the world's gonna end, really. So, either <laughs> get with it or not. Right. The struggle you know, and celebration. Says, life or death, folks. Choose life. <laughs> right. Light, and that's light that's and a Hebrew thing. Yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, Reverend <laughs> Susan. Jewish thing. And yeah, yeah. Um, Reverend Susan. So, at the Universalist uh, Unitarian Church, what is the struggle celebration intersection for you at this time of the year? Well, I think you use Unitarian Universalists are known for justice work, which in my opinion anyway, has to come from some spiritual grounding. And I think for some of the parishioners in my um, congregation, this is a very tough time of year for some of the reasons Stephen mentioned. These people are Jewish or they're not Christian and they don't want to be bombarded by all of those elements of Christianity. For other people in my congregation, it's a wonderful time of year. There's an emphasis on family and certain events. You know, this is the time of year that we always take the granddaughters to the Nutcracker, or uh, we always go to see the Cape Band Big Band concert, uh, which I mentioned earlier really cheered me and put me in a in a really great frame of mind. So I think because you use our, such a variety of theologies and spiritual practices, I couldn't tell you one solution. I think that people find, one thing I have noticed is that um, with, with this time of year, I tend to add more choices for people to come and be with others because there is such a tendency for all of us, myself included, to stay home and watch bad TV because I'm in a bad mood and I don't want to spread it to anybody. But that is actually the worst possible thing I could do. And as soon as I come to a meeting or gather with friends, go to a concert, complain and cry with a, whatever it is, mm -hmm. as soon as I connect um, with service, you feel better. 
Well, that really is the power of faith-based communities, is the, that power of connection when, as individuals, we, uh, we, we tend to select different communities, but and, and to find our tribes, right? <laughs> That's part of it. And then we pull away and we're ourselves, and then we move in and out of different communities. And this time of year, there is a sense of, of, a, of a wholeness of community, but yet uh, also isolation. And um, it, in this time of year can be difficult for people as well as celebratory. So in the different communities and faith communities, um, how are you, what are you seeing uh, with people? How, how are they, uh, what are they saying in terms of uh, seeking assistance with inner struggles around uh, understanding what's happening in our society today? Whether it's uh, the sense of intolerance or increased violence um, against people, um, the, the, um, the, the differences between people or ideologies, what are you finding? I think I need to come at this in a, a little different way. Can I try that? Absolutely. So, so a lot of, um, for Christmas, I'll just speak about Christmas for a minute. There's some churches offer something called um, Blue Christmas. And it's a service that's more like a lamentation um, mm -hmm. of coming, people are coming from, the, the holidays are painful because of family issues or loss. If someone's lost a loved one this time of year, it's can be very hard if it's the first anniversary. But, but in these services of Blue Christmas, there's room for lamentation about not only their individual sorrows, but societal sorrows. So last year in Advent, I didn't do a Blue Christmas per se, but we did Advent meditations around um, some of the losses that we were seeing, the loss of, of uh, a sense of safety or the loss of, like, a lot of people talked about the loss of kind of cultural integrity. Mm -hmm. um, the loss of mine is personal. My grief is around the loss of truth telling. You know, so, so there's ways of doing that in terms of services. But in conversations, what I'm finding is it's very hard for people that I'm with to really talk about these deep differences. I, I sense it's extremely difficult on, for people to actually share where they are. And I'll get little things from people, sometimes notes where someone will say something on the side, or someone will disappear for a while mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's just too much. And um, it's interesting to kind of negotiate that pastorally. And we try to do it as clergy. We, try, we, like, we, we started wanting to do services around these issues to give right. people a place to lift it up, to talk about it, but also to find some strength together through our interfaith connections and the sense of community. And, and we actually did. And we did we it. Have, we we didn't have done it. Do we it. didn't we want to do it. We've done it. And, and we're, we're going to continue, and continue, continue to do it. it. Yes. So there, we've gotten together as clergy and talked about how can we do this, and we try to give a place. And we have. What's an example? Thanksgiving. Uh, well, joyful uh, noise for justice. We did a joyful noise for justice um, a year ago, a year yeah, and a half March. ago in in, yeah. in, uh, in in Rockport, uh, and then um, Anne had this crazy idea that we were going to have a fast, a communal fast, a communal fast. Yep. She declared a communal fast uh, uh, in uh, for some reflection and sense of protest over the family separation policy. Um, on the border. On the we border. did a vigil right. at the in July. Statue. And I, and I, you know, we had like a hundred people come. That's coming up great. for our fast, the Jewish fast times. Yeah. So, if, and, and fast means different things in different traditions. Right. For right. for me, you know, like Yom Kippur, Tisha B'Av, fast means no food, no water, from sundown to sundown. So it's like twenty five hours or longer in the in the summer. It's like full on. So I was like, really, people are going to go for that? But they did. We had like a hundred people. But more a lot impressive. Of the yeah. next day, to end the fast, they had like 60 people show up. I, I couldn't be there. So, uh, it was we, a celebration. It was well, food to, to, end, break, to, to break the fast. Yeah, to break yeah. fast. But it wasn't sense, a lot of food. It was and to hear more readings. And, people yeah. needing to come together right. and wanting to and have talk. This. So we, as the clergy group, talked about the Associated Clergy of Cape Ann, uh, talked about having um, 
monthly or you know quarterly something some kind of regular forum for song folks. and solidarity this yeah. was I mean most uh, dramatically was the our Friday night service after the shootings in Pittsburgh uh, we we invited the, the community to come in so I sent an invitation out to the uh, to the clergy group uh, and then realized that some of them had just sent it to their whole congregations um, <laughs> and you know so as that week went on it was a very intense week uh, for the synagogue and, and our community. People were feeling very vulnerable. A lot of the way this plays out in, the, in, in my community is with a sense of safety. Like, do people feel safe right. in the building? And right. how can we help people feel safe uh, in the building? Uh, so during that week, we have um, different configurations in our sanctuary, but basically 280 is our full-on biggest we can get. And... Uh, <laughs> we had 400 people RSVP to come to that service. I've never led a service like that before. It was full. It was and amazing. then there were about 60 people yeah. standing in the back. It was great. And, and um, the sense of solidarity and the sense of... Um, and several people said, uh, thanked the synagogue because it gave, like, really the... We needed the a place best to go. Space. Yeah, yeah, I mean, space and, to and grieve and a space to be together. people got together, together the day of. The day of the shooting, there were people gathering in vigil at... Uh, at St. Paul's and there was a need to come together to say this just can't be us this just mm -hmm. can't be what our country's become what we do. Right. Um, and uh, yeah that is this the, cannot be who we are right that was we yeah. cannot be this this way right so right. first we got to come together right and then we got to work together uh, pull together and pull together that right. was, that's the <laughs> that was uh, we got to pull together yeah. and we all got to pull together yeah. so uh, how you know the first piece happened very organically and very beautifully, uh, and then the next piece is always going to be more challenging. Um, right when there's not the tragedy, how can we get people to come to our interfaith Thanksgiving service? But this year it was better right. attended than in years past. Right, and how do we you know it's, uh, how do we identify where? Uh, those little containers for intolerance, uh, for misunderstanding, for for untruth. Mm -hmm. Where are those things thriving within our communities? Right. And how right. do we come together and right. identify those places and open them up? And well, wh where are you seeing? Uh, you know, are you seeing that? Are you seeing these um, these little pockets of intolerance or or? Uh, I, I'll be really honest. My 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 folks. And if they're listening, I, I'm just going to say this. They're, I don't think I really get to see it. I, I, I intuit it sometimes, but I don't think people are openly intolerant around me. I might hear about something through two or three levels, but where, we, where I see it like around issues is we'll read the paper, somebody will send in a letter, you'll see something there, you'll see it... Um, You'll hear somebody talking. Sometimes I'm at the Lone Gall and I hear an incredible conversation that I can't even believe is going on, you know, or n nothing against the Lone Gall. Right. But, <laughs> you know, sorry. I buy my coffee there. We love but, the Lone Gall. <laughs> we love the Lone Gall. Yes. So, you know, so you hear things or you notice things, mm -hmm. and sometimes it actually does happen in smaller groups. Well, it, it's present. It's even present. In our, it's it's just live. kind of bubbling around, you and, know. And, uh, and and something else too, just to throw out there. This is not new. No. Uh, this has been all around for a long time. Intolerance, just, hatred, violence against it's others. It's just there's a lot more permission now. Yes. To, more, we, and we talked about that. To be open that. about it. Yes. Right. Permission to be open about Openly it. Openly hate and call it good. Mm -hmm. And 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 lie. And it's and lie. impacting our our society, our local communities, and ourselves, which is. Again, how do we come together to cope with it? How do we cope with it individually, especially at a time when there's pressure to feel joy and peace and mm -hmm. loveliness and family and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's you know it's bumping up against that the time of year when I feel like also people I know they really they need this time of year they're mm -hmm. they're nostalgic for this time of year it helps them feel connected and um, and loved and comforted, and uh, but yet this year it's just a little bit. The edge is is sharper. I feel. Some of the things I see people doing are doing a lot, as Susan was mentioning about justice work, 
we all have congregations, rabbis included. They're all different. The people do different things to work with feelings like this. So some people are more proactively justice workers. Some of my folks have gotten more involved with uh, the, the immigration immigrants in this community, or they'll be more involved with the Grace Center. They'll be more involved with the Open Door. They'll look for places of service. Maybe they'll go and read at the nursing homes. They will go to places where um, they feel that their action can be good for others. And that's a huge piece of coping that I see. Is it activism? Is that um, what that's, you're talking about? No, there's service and there's activism. Service and activism. Yeah. So Very some different. people are activists and they'll organize and they'll go march and they'll um, mm -hmm. do political work and some people will do service and some people will go on retreat or do more prayer or, you know, everybody copes differently. I think with it. It's interesting to watch people find different ways of, of dealing with things. Susan, what about your uh, uh, comment on, on uh, coping, please? Well, I think, you know, one of the things I found over the years was that there was, for some reason, I felt that I had to do a number of things every year at this time. I had to bake cookies and I had to send out Christmas cards and and I don't know, one day I woke up and I said, no, I don't. <laughs> and so what I tell my people is if it doesn't feed your soul, and these are, these are rituals that you yourself created, well, don't do it. Just stop doing it. Um, that doesn't mean I'm telling them stop serving or stop coming and helping to make lunches for the Action Lunch uh, homeless program that we have or stop volunteering but it's the superficial stuff. You don't have to go to the mall. You don't have to buy everyone you know a gift. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And I recently had something with my own family member where it was very clear to me that our values over the years have maybe not grown together. Um, I would rather spend Christmas Day with my children not competing with who got the most presents under the tree, but to just be with each other. I'm, I, I think one of you said earlier, people go away, you know, rather than have the 15 family members, half of whom are really devoted to our current administration and the other half are horrified, they don't wanna do it. So I say, don't do it. Do something different. Do something different. This year. But that um, doesn't mean that that you can put your head in the sand either. There's that line between self-care and selfishness. Mm -hmm. Well, that's such an important point because, um, you know, we, we do create our own traditions. And, uh, and consumerism is really difficult to deal with this time of year. And uh, so... You know what are what are some of your I guess we can just go around the table some some of your favorite um, pieces of uh, uh, advice that you offer community wide regarding uh, <laughs> how you know either retreating from um, consumerism or engaging in a different kind of way what. I smiled because my first piece of advice always to my community is pray more. <laughs> Just start praying. <laughs> Get connected with God. You know? So go deep. I always I always go there first. But but after that would be would would really go to active um, actively attempting to love every day the person in front of you as an image of the holy, as an image of God, the icon of God. Mm -hmm. That neighbor, in that moment, and... Um, right. No matter what. No right. matter what. love no matter what. No matter what. Yeah. And, you know, and that, I really, it's kind of basic for me. I, I don't have a lot of, you know, when I'm, when I'm feeling the stress of the, the holiday, I tend to, to go toward that. Mm -hmm. And so I never ask them to do something I haven't done. So <laughs> I just, I go for that. Yeah, there's nothing like the power of love. And it transforms you uh, when you remember to turn it on. <laughs> right. Right, we can forget. To notice it or go to gratitude. Yeah, to, go to gratitude. To the fact of gift. 
Yeah. yeah. I didn't make the world. Rabbi Lewis? What, yeah. What do you um, well, those are good. Uh, it's very different. You know, it's it, the... The, um, the dynamic for The dynamics is, is really different. Is different. So, uh, you know, the challenge in this time of year for uh, non-Christians, uh, you know, people who are uh, affirmatively doing something else, uh, is that you're just reminded how much out of the culture you are and the whole landscape transforms to celebrate this most wonderful time of the year. And uh, so if that's not your most wonderful time of the year, then you know everyone uh, has adopted various strategies of how to deal with that. It's most challenging with kids, with little kids, you know, as they grow up and they, they try to figure out their strategies. In terms of, you know, it, it, um, relying on our tradition Hanukkah is, you know, to sort of go deeper into that. Um, you know, the Hanukkah candles are not supposed to be used for any practical purpose. So for the first half hour, you're just supposed to admire them. It's just the beauty of the That's candles so and I the celebration that. of the miracle, right? You're not supposed to turn on the lights. You know, you're not supposed to walk across the room by the light of those candles, right? So it's just this invitation for that kind of quiet meditative mm -hmm. moment. So that mm -hmm. just sort of getting deeper into, uh, into Hanukkah is, um, and then finding the strategies to be uh, a minority within the culture. Um, and uh, the, the answer that this community has given, the Gloucester community with the Hanukkah menorah made of lobster pots is kind of a brilliant way of saying we're distinct and we have this distinct tradition and we're a part of this place mm -hmm. in a very organic way. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Susan? Oh. Well, as I said earlier, my people will do any number of things. Um, a couple of years ago, one of our younger members with little kids suggested that we start caroling. Mm -hmm. And one of the shopkeepers in Rockport reported to her that that had been the highlight of yeah. his Nice. Christmas season. So we're going caroling again this Friday. Um, some people would rather stay home than go caroling. I think it's really fun to sing with people, especially when there are lots of little kids around. I have kids who are 20 and 22, so to me, I, you know, it's just great to be with little children because they're the ones who are so excited. Yeah. Um, it's true. I. You know, maybe I wouldn't use the word pray more, but to add Sabbath, to add spiritual time in your lives at this time of year is yeah. important. The more stress in my life, the more I need that. I love when the Dalai Lama says I meditate for several hours a day and someone said, well, what about when you're really busy? And he said, oh, then I just need to do it more. Yeah. Um, right. We started a meditation at the church, 25 minutes, we sit in silence. It started out maybe three of us. A lot of weeks, there are about 12 people. So, as I said earlier, I just keep offering or coming up with another idea of what else can we do as a community. Mm -hmm. And then people either say, I don't really want to do that, or they come. I hope they do come. I hope they. I hope your places of worship are full uh, this holiday season. Reverend Susan Moran, thank you for joining us. Rabbi Stephen Lewis and Pastor Anne Deneen, it's been a pleasure to have a conversation here on Cape Ann Report. To our viewers, happy holidays and all the best to you. Until the next time on Cape Ann Report, take care.